I'm a medical physicist by training. So what that means is physics undergrad and then um, the I, you know, I'm highly biased, but I think the the coolest medical physics program kind of where it really started is at University of Wisconsin. And so I went there for grad school and uh, medical physics is usually kind of specializing in two directions. It's either therapy, meaning radiation therapy for cancer or diagnostic, which is imaging. Either way, it's looking at the way radiation interacts with the body. And um, it, usually that's been ionizing radiation, but there's also some other types that have been of interest. Um, it, so there's a thing called physics of the body, which looks at like the mechanics, the natural resonant frequency of your arms and legs when you walk, for example, depending on the length and, you know, just the, you know, function of lungs as a um, hydraulic system or, as, you know, there, there's like, a whole bunch of uh, sort of physics analogs that you can study. And then also um, ultrasound. Um, it's kind of now expanded to like any imaging modality pretty much and any treatment modality that is physical. Um, but I went into radiation oncology and um, I didn't know whether I wanted to be uh, academic or, you know, on the commercial side, just kind of assume the academic route because that's what most people in, in my program did. Um, but that ended up at a national lab and it was kind of a weird story because um, they needed someone who could get a high security clearance because what we were doing was um, converting a bunch of weapons codes to medical codes. And um, so we had to look at this was during the Clinton dual use era, if anyone remembers that. Um, and, you know, the goal was to show that all the defense money could also be used for medicine. And so, you know, that was kind of a, an interesting um, thesis experiment experience working along a bunch of weapons designers trying to understand their code and uh, which was, you know, really old Fortran and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so um, from there, I went on to get clinical experience because you have to do that when you're in this field. And so went to UCSF and uh, worked in the clinic, kind of rotated through all the different positions there, and then ended up uh, one of the local manufacturers, Siemens Oncology, uh, said they wanted to, you know, productize some of my research. And, you know, who doesn't jump at that? Okay, great. So naive. Oh my God, Joe, I had no idea what I was getting into. And um, joined a company full on and was, you know, totally shocked by these concepts of quality and, you know, uh, everything that went into making a product. And uh, actually, I joined during an FDA shutdown. Well, it was a voluntary um, shutdown. And so that was kind of like a good experience of um, understanding what led to that and how we got out of it and, you know, th that whole era. And uh, so... Then, you know, the company, ultimately Siemens uh, closed that whole division, but I got recruited for Varian and they wanted to start a new treatment machine, but they couldn't tell me what it is. And so, you know, when you're Varian in radiation oncology, that is a really good, um, you know, that, that company is, it has a very good reputation. And I don't know if you've ever interviewed for a position where they can't tell you what the position is. I was intrigued. I was like, all right, I got to do this. And uh, then, you know, and I was already totally comfortable with the uh, ultimate secrecy from my time at the national lab. So, you know, it didn't, didn't seem as weird to me as it might to you. Um, that product became TrueBeam, which is now the leading linear accelerator um, in the world. It, there's about 60,000 patient treatment fractions treated on it every day around the world. Wow. So, um, you know, I look back at the time that we were developing that and think every minute I spent extra fighting for something with the engineers or doing whatever we had to do to really just get that extra feature in or do something a little more was totally worth it, you know, and that honestly is what I think about today when I think about creating products is, you know, I'm always kind of fast forwarding in my head, like, yeah, this is a little bit of a a push right now to to be able to do this, but it's going to make such a difference when this scales up and it, it is affecting patients everywhere. Yeah. So anyway, um, it, you know, from there after that launched, I really wanted to create a community. So it's a lot like what you did here, but this was kind of like around the machine and, and the radiation oncology community. So we, we I built something into it, which is a whole story we can talk about at some point called developer mode, and then supported the community who were um, 
making developer mode. We've never had a developer mode in radiation oncology before. And uh, so that was that was pretty um, fun and just allowed me to be on both sides of the fence. So working really closely with those academic communities. And um, that was when I um, got a couple of adjunct professorships myself. Um, and so I, I've just always enjoyed that really early creative process of working with different um, research groups, right? And they're in that exploration phase. And I'm kind of thinking ahead to the whole big picture of where could this go and when is the right moment to free it from that. I'd like to talk to you about that separately, but um, let's, yeah. uh, let's talk about uh, today's topic, which is taking uh, your concept from research and how do you get to commercialization? How did you approach that? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a right moment to spin something out, right? And and you, the hard thing is when you're sitting in academia, and usually I speak to the other half of this audience, where I'm I'm talking to the people who are you know professors in their academic lab and saying, you know, how do I think about this? But for you guys, you know, you're already in the space and you're working on something, and um, I feel like being able to kind of get the big picture. And sometimes I describe that um, with this slide. So I have to tell you the funny thing about this talk is um, I uh, made all the pictures with OpenAI. And so um, you're gonna hate me for pointing this out because it's gonna be one of those there goes your weekend sort of things because it's so fun to play with. But anyway, you go to uh, OpenAI and you give it a textual description of what you think mm -hmm. you want to visualize mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it comes back um you know with things and so it, it's a very fun thing to play with um and that intersection of playful technology oh, i'm just like you know anyway so i you know usually talk to them about like the overall process that you're going to go through is going to look something like this and kind of like break down all the steps of exploring and choosing that direction to focus on and developing it and then you know understanding that you're going to go through a very heavy regulatory process at the end of your development and needs really to be integrated with your development, which is the whole purpose of the V, which is, you know, something that is probably difficult to them. And so, you know, I talk about spinning out usually somewhere in this phase, right? Because you can't do this kind of, um, you know, heavy quality work when you're in a university lab. That's, that's an overhead that you need outside investment to be able to, um, help with, but how much and how do you how do you gauge that, right? So I don't know. I, I'm kind of curious, like how many of you did your your company ideas that inception? How many of you had that rooted in a university kind of setting? I don't believe anyone. Well. Alyssa, that's that's not you. I don't believe anyone on the call has that experience. Oh, Mark, you do? Mark uh, Matthews? Yes, yes. Yeah. We, we generated our technology in the university and moved it out. It started, it was a research project. Um, and so that's, that's definitely the path we took. It's been and, a long, long path. And you successfully and profitably commercialized? Uh, no, we are the commercialization is still in front of us. Yeah, I, I have found a few uh, examples of from university to why commercialization to have been successful in, in my time in industry. Eddie and Mara, yeah, but my previous company, not this one right now, uh, I founded with two academics, and although it's a great idea. Again, it, uh, it it was not successful that time. It's an idea that will come back and back until it works. But uh, yeah, and actually, it's it's heavy physics. So Michelle, it might be interesting to chat with you about it offline. Yes, count me in. I I do have a, a curiosity problem, so I would probably be really interested in learning more. Mine. <laughs> so um, so one company that was a spin out from UW which is doing quite well, um, but it's more of a service company, is Cyrus Biotechnology, which does protein modeling. Um, but that was a university idea that has, has spun out and been successful. Um, interestingly enough, I was just on a call yesterday judging a whole bunch of university startup projects. 
Um, there was one there out of all the ones I've seen that seems like it'll probably get to commercialization, um, which I can't say anything about, but, um, but the majority of them really struggle either with getting the financial aspects, right? It's a great product idea, but you can't actually make money with it. Um, or they just don't have the, um, the leadership to, to figure out how to turn it into a business. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, right. Joe, I'd like to add a few comments here. Because we have we have we have three or four companies that are spin outs of universities here um, that work. Michelle on. is not familiar with what you're working on. Would you give her a little background, Dwayne? Oh, sure, sure, Michelle. It's nice to meet you. Um, so um, outside of the, the 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 podcast and events we run, we also have a consulting advisory practice. We work with early stage companies on uh, fractionalizing a number of the C-suite um, within their, their early stage companies. So I think pre-seed through like a series A, even B, um, fractional CFO, commercial operations, those types of things. Um, and so, but we're here in Cleveland, Ohio. And so like the Midwest, which I, I'm, I'm guessing you're in Wisconsin. Is that, did we see that? Right? Uh, um, yeah. Not anymore, but that's oh, okay. where, I, yeah, where I grew up for sure. Yeah. So, so, so something that like is, is a struggle in the Midwest, right. Is that there's, there's not the same resources you have in Boston, um, San Francisco, even Minneapolis, even though they're part of the Midwest, San Diego, um, where, you know, you can go outside, throw a stone and hit someone that's in the in the in the in the med tech space and so but a lot of these companies that are spinning out of these universities they or even think if they have a good idea or not they have nowhere to really go to figure that out so you had on that slide about assuming you're solving a real problem they might think they are and even locally they might get mixed up with a hospital that like in in Cleveland we we have this problem where if you go somewhere you go to the Cleveland clinic the Cleveland clinic's a specialty hospital the, the issues that they have that they're trying to solve is probably not realistic for like 80% of the <clears throat> uh, hospitals across the U.S., right? So you deal That's with that. exactly the number I use, usually yeah. 80%, right? So about 20% are academic leadership in our field, at least radiation oncology, and then about 80% are community clinics, you know, second or third tier kind of uh, to test out technology. And so yeah. that is the majority of your market. That's where it's got to work. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And then it's it's also it's not even identifying the problem, it's telling the problem, right? Like it's 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 getting them to understand that in healthcare the problem goes across patients, uh clinicians, the hospital system, insurance. It's it's figuring out where you sit in all those problems and what your true value proposition is. But it's just something I see in the Midwest a lot because there's just you, you don't have that. And then there's also the power hungry game of like there's groups that are like, well, this is our turf. And you don't see that in other areas. It's really interesting, but I just wanted to comment on it. Uh, no, so there's a couple of things on there that I have to follow up on, right? So it, you're absolutely right. I, I think you're right on in everything that you've said. And that is the space where I've been trying to be a bridge, I think, for, for most of my career from you know, both, both sides. And so, you know, explaining a little bit further about, you know, how to mature their idea to the extent that um, they can start to get feedback. Right. And I think in academics, when you look at a uh, research paper, it's always like building very, very, very slowly to the conclusion. Right. You're laying out the hypothesis. You're talking about materials and methods. You're seeing you know, what then you get to the results and then you get to the conclusion. And that just does not go over. You can't pitch that. Right. So, you know what they there's first this very divergent process of, you know, exploring things. And then they get to a point where, like, that's the idea. And um they can begin to focus. So uh, we, we're gonna, uh, one thing that's interesting that I think when I talk to universities is they have like the idea that they just go to their tech transfer department on campus and that department is gonna handle everything for them and it's gonna be great. And so here's where the part where you're on the other side now as uh, you know, a CEO and you're trying to license in some of this technology and it gets really hairy because, um, you know, this negotiation can be really complicated. So I think um, what I'd like to actually let's let's just talk a minute about that negotiation because I think that is something that I've been through from beginning to end a couple of times now, and um, there's a lot of things that I wish that I would have done differently when I um, started this whole process. And so when I look at 
that first meeting with the tech transfer company from any university. And here's another thing that I've learned is the tech transfer departments at all universities now across the U.S. and even internationally are starting to meet up and they're starting to have um, a, a very coordinated ask for how these um, processes, how these technologies get licensed. So um, <laughs> that makes it very expensive. And the reason why probably most of you didn't start this way is, or haven't really seriously considering it because it's a huge upfront cost, right? So whatever you're licensing in has to be 10 times better than anything you have access to otherwise, because to be able to go through this process and meet all the demands that are gonna come from the tech transfer group is incredibly expensive. So there's a couple of tips here. You know, one is I always read the mission statement of the tech transfer group. And I, honestly, for any meeting that I go into any sort of B2B situation, um, read the mission statement. Because when you start to get into that really difficult part of the negotiation where they want 10% equity and they want to, you know, all this stuff, you say, look, we're not going to be viable. Your mission is to get these university ideas out into the world, get them translated and get them in clinical practice. And if you take 10%, that's 10% less I don't have to be able to motivate my employees to get the proper investment and you know, be able to bring this idea home. And you're not going to meet your mission. I'm not going to meet my mission. And that doesn't help anyone. And that logic has helped, right? So, you know, definitely use, <laughs> bring it back to what you have in common and then, uh, you know, make sure that you can use that. You know, and the other thing is getting to this moment of when you spin out, sometimes when you spin out is when you know you're on the precipice of developing a whole bunch of interesting technology that should not be owned by the university. <laughs> Right. So, you know, that is something to, to think about. And that's something that the tech transfer group is never going to tell you. But there may be a moment when you realize, like, you got to solve a hard problem. You're going to want to do that outside of what's happening in the university so that your company can own that IP free and clear. Right. Also means you're going to pay the upfront patent costs. But in the long run, um, that's going to be a better position to be in. And so, um, there's a moment when I uh, um, come back in this discussion and talk a little bit about, um, oh, well, one thing that supports my, you know, assertion that this is kind of a difficult process is, I don't know if you've looked at this um, website, spinout.fyi, so apparently FYI is a new domain name that I didn't know about, um, but in it's really kind of a, a VC group that has been publishing what the terms are that were acceptable for, um, you know, like I say, there's been an increasingly consolidation in this um, negotiation. And their average university stake and spin outs, um, the tech transfer groups, you know, took about 12.8% on average. Uh, but some of them were up to 70%. Like, how do you run a business when 70% of the equity has off the top gone to the university, right? That's, that's going to be a, a, to me, I think there was probably some kind of, um, you know, somebody didn't know what they were getting into there. Um, you know, and then just the comments about the spin-out process is really opaque, it's bureaucratic, it's painful, and so on. So I think that you know, this is not a bad place to go. One of the things that they uh, advocate for on this website is coming up with a term sheet for universities that would be much like um, if you've ever used safe notes to finance your seed round or something like that, right? It's it's like a really simple template that has just a few um, blanks in it. And all right, guys, you want to consolidate? Let's consolidate around a lot of these complicated terms. Both times that I've been through this process from beginning to end with UCLA and with Stanford, um, and then I've popped in on various ones that were ongoing, that was a year-long process, right? Um, a year-long negotiation. And, uh, you know, th that time could have been spent towards something super productive, but the term, the, the stakes are so high that you really want it to be as, um, you know, favorable as possible. 
So um, this is kind of just something where I've, um, you know, talked about what to expect in these negotiations. I think one thing that has helped me is to have a clear vision of what the product is relative to the patent that you're, you're licensing, because usually what is in that patent that you're trying to negotiate is one small piece of the overall product. So, you know, I was looking at a $6 million treatment machine that we were trying to develop and I'm negotiating a patent for, you know, a, a, a tiny piece inside the linear accelerator. And it, yeah, it's a core piece, but, you know, I also have to provide a treatment table and a treatment console and um, cameras and, you know, a lot of other things that have nothing whatsoever to do with that. And so that can also, I literally made a spreadsheet of all the different parts of what the product was going to be and said, look, guys, you know, what I'm negotiating is, you know, essentially at most a hundred thousand dollar part. And so your slice can come out of that hundred thousand dollars, not out of the $6 million treatment machine. You were talking a bit about, you know, having product come out of university. I just posted in the webinar chat, an article from 2019 out of the group called why are productive university partnerships so hard? And, uh, it was, a guest post that my friend Melissa wrote. She's a 10X alumna, and she um, spent 12 years in research administration at the University of Illinois at Chicago's School of Public Health. And she gave five reasons why partnerships are so hard. I'll just read that top line. You're welcome to visit the article. The purpose of university research is to generate knowledge, not value, is number one. Number two, Without tenure. Saying is to professors what exits are to startups. So lifetime job security. Three, faculty members are not CEOs. Four is be prepared for sticker shots that university budgets have a ton of mandatory and direct costs and they're not set up for this. And university researchers perhaps are not known for um, efficiency and time management because maybe like you, they find something like open AI and spend the whole weekend making pictures of butterflies <laughs> on the world. So- um, Excellent, yeah, so you've got a link to that. I definitely- I do, I just put it in the, uh, it's not appearing properly. I almost didn't share, it's like what happened to the images, but I think you'll be able to get what you need out of it anyhow. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yes. No, I think um, uh, that those are awesome points, actually, that really says a lot. And although I'm kind of emphasizing the spin out moment in this particular discussion and in this talk, but everywhere along the line, you're, you're going to run into essentially these same issues, right? So I don't care if you're talking about you know, your first clinical site, and you have to sign some kind of evaluation agreement with that university because you want them to, um, you know, explore, put your product through the paces, um, and get that first, uh, you know, patient clinical use case done. Whenever it is, you're you're gonna most likely run up against this. You know, who owns an intellectual property? What <laughs> what happened right. to it going forward? Uh, Gunjan wrote in the comments. Uh, well, Gunjan, take yourself off mute and and share your perspective, please. Sure. So I, I really work in the area of uh, international innovation. Uh, but here in California, what I have found uh, is that uh, the private universities, Caltech and Stanford, are much more willing to engage with startups and get their technology out there. Um, you know, I have several friends who are professors at UCLA. And they struggle because the University of California system makes it very difficult for them to take the ideas out to, to the real world. And UC produces so much you know, of, of the world's innovation. I mean, the biggest example here in town is Amgen. You know, UCLA didn't get a dime out of what Amgen produced because they were just too difficult to deal with, I understand, you know, when Amgen first started. So uh, I just wanted to get your thoughts about uh, you know, private universities versus uh, uh, you know, versus uh, state-owned universities. Well, yeah, um, interesting. So I do think that, you know, I've worked with Stanford quite a bit over the years. So the Varian campus where I was for 10 years is right. Stanford, yeah. Varian itself was a spinoff from Stanford. Right. 
many years ago. One of the, you know, early, early ones that was probably the least successful in their history of all their, you know, amazing spin outs. But anyway, um, it, it, so Stanford does encourage people to spin out. They do have a lot of help. They do have the, um, you know, biotech center there, which is amazing. So that is to me the Bible in terms of how to do a spin out. I learned so much from that. Um, and I have taken some of their courses. Um, so that's good, but they also get rich off it. <laughs> I mean, come on, they are taking a huge slice of those startups. And so the Tibere, which was one of the, um, the companies that I was CEO of at the time was a spin out from Stanford. And that negotiation was tough. And yet you go to the tech transfer office. It's a, it's a, it's a whole campus of an, itself now, you know, set up four beautiful new buildings and, you know, the, <laughs> so they have definitely perfected this. They've um, made uh, um, a very, very healthy process, um, it, but they take a heavy stake and perhaps rightly so, because they are providing more value than just the IP, right? They're also, yeah, there's a whole ecosystem there around everything that spins out, um, including investors. And so, you know, in that case, I, I get it. Um, some, I would say some universities are better at this than others. So um, University of Minnesota, I agree. I see that in the comments. Um, they have been much easier to work with. UW has uh, been much, uh, Wisconsin has been a bit tougher. They have this Wharf Wisconsin Alumni Foundation um, that originally was created off of vitamin D. And um, they were able to set up a, a much tougher, I would say, process. Um, good for the academic, but hard for the startup that just wants to bring this out. So there, there is kind of a, a spectrum out there. University of Florida, I worked with their tech transfer company a couple, uh, department a couple of times. Breeze, easy, right? They, they just like were frictionless. Um, so there's uh, quite a, a disparity. I think that's probably why they're meeting more often and trying to get to a, a point of being, um, you know, uh, more consolidated in what they ask for. Because you know what happens in a sort of heterogeneous environment is like the universities that do this right, right? They are going to succeed and they got to get that balance right between providing good incentives for the academic and making it easy enough for the startup companies to work with. And then um, the ones that make this too hard, they're just going to be obsolete, right? Because ultimately, I don't think universities are going to survive in the future just educating students, right? That's easy enough to do on YouTube right now. Yes. So while I have the mic, uh, Joe and Michelle, I just wanted to mention another point, uh, you know, in my international work, what I'm finding is that, you know, simple ideas that are coming out of universities sometimes would never make it to the real world because of some of these barriers, the barriers around expensive clinical trials, the barriers around the licensing and so on. And I'm working with two different, uh, two different companies. Uh, both are actually in the pharma or biopharma space rather than med device, but the concepts are similar. So one of them has licensed, um, you know, uh, basically a transdermal application of a drug that used to be injected before. That's all. It's a drug that's very well accepted. And all they've done is you can apply it directly to the skin rather than through, you know, through, through an injection. And so that allows you to you know, to have certain advantages, but this product would never make it to market just because the clinical trials would have been so expensive. And what we are doing for them is conducting the clinical trials on, on pigs and mini pigs in India at like one fourth the cost, as well as within like three months as opposed to a year, because India has the capacity to do that. So I'm seeing a lot of incremental innovation. This is not earth shaking, you know, you know, change the world kind of innovation, but definitely things that, that benefit humanity that are happening through this international collaboration. And I wondered if you've had some experience with, with something like that. Um, I don't, but I'm really glad to hear about it. So that's really an important niche that I think is you know, too high of a, of a barrier. I mean, granted, um, you know, the full blown trial has its, uh, you know, randomized controlled uh, trial has its, has its place for sure, but you don't want to be 
exploring at, at that phase, right? That, that should be your confirmation phase. And you need to do so much before you really invest in that um, full trial. And so knowing that you can do that quickly, uh, that's a huge value. That's a huge value. Yeah, no, that's, that's excellent. Thank you. Please continue. Michelle, with your presentation. Oh, well, I've just been kind of like um, picking in and choosing slides here, but um, there was something else that I thought would be good. Um, to... when, when you uh, told me about this title, I thought perhaps there was going to be something about um, the decision to go or no go or when to become public and when to um, approach the market. Um, yeah. Perhaps you know something about that. Yeah. So um, <laughs> uh, in a sense, like this talk is kind of like eight eight things that you should have lined up before you before you do it. So, um, you know, the incorporation part, a lot of people ask me like, oh, it, it, you know, is that hard? That's like the easiest thing, right? Yeah, everyone here knows that you, you fill out some forms and you register and you pay your 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 dues and you're and you're in that part's easy. And if you're able, you can share this deck with me. I can give it to the group afterward. Oh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. We can do that. Um, so these are some things that I think should happen before you spin out that um, are exploratory in nature in in my read of things. One is, you know, your unmet need. Make sure that you're looking uh, at, um, it, you know, you have a very good articulation of what that that need is. And then, you know, just begin to dive in and focus on that. So I talk about academics, you know, not only being used to writing long papers with the results at the end, you got to flip that around and make a newspaper article out of it with a headline <laughs> that is your result. And, um, you know, include the most relevant details up front first, and then the least relevant details kind of at the end. So if it gets cut off or, <laughs> which in this case is not the printer cutting off, in this case, it is, you know, someone's cell phone bringing in a tweet that's interesting and they and you've lost them right so everyone in this world knows that already but you probably forgot that you know it and that um for an academic this is kind of going the other way um i do think that there's a lot to be said here for replication of science and so one of the things that i used to require when i was working at varian with various research groups is that they swap <laughs> solutions from time to time box up their solution like a black box, give it to another clinic, have them push the buttons, have them use their clinical data and see if you get the same results. Because unfortunately, there can be all sorts of unconscious bias. I'm going to assume the best of my researchers and um, assume that none of it is um, you know, intentional bias, that all of this is they don't even realize that um, they made certain assumptions here. And in, in some ways, it gets back to the early comment about um, a, a world-class university hospital is very different than a community hospital. And yet the majority, so you're, you're likely to know, you know, have contacts at these, you know, higher academic centers, but the majority of the market, that 80% is still uh, a much different beast. So you need to give your uh, concept to someone in that 80% and see, you know, does this work for them? This is very much in my sweet spot. I just put in the chat for everyone what a Proper, uh, proper value proposition looks like the five things you need to fill in to really make sure you know what you're talking about. Oh, five things. Okay, so I've I've only got three. So I I was obviously have something to learn there. Yeah, but then you know to get them to think about the business model, and here's where you see a lot of um, you know ideas just aren't going to cut it. I have definitely seen some where I've seen a lot of companies fail on this referrals and reimbursement um, pipeline just not being there and not being what they expected, right? So that is where the, the academic person is going to need help because they probably, if they if that isn't set up within the university center, someone is going to have to come in and consult with them and make sure that they understand how those patients are going to get to the product and um, who is going to actually get the benefit of the reimbursement and how much. And then a cultural fit. That was one that I kind of made up, but I've been involved in a couple of products, which were theoretically great. So one example, prone breast treatment. Okay. So treating breast cancer patients in the prone position means the breasts hang down in, in a pendulous um, way. And that's actually better for bringing in a treatment beam, right? Because you don't want to hit the lung. You don't want to hit 
um, the heart or any of the other sensitive structures. So the more you can pull that breast away from the rest of the body, it, you know, the better off you are in terms of possible side effects. Well, it just turned out that, eh, you know, the, the, you have to have a little bit of a different mindset when you're setting a patient up in that position. So we made a special tabletop, you know, made it as easy as possible. No one liked it. Right. It just meant, oh, we, you know, the, the physician has to be there and that's too hard for them at the first treatment session. And, Culturally, it didn't work. In theory, it was great, but um, you know, just the way things were set up, it it didn't fly. Um, it did. Graham just fly. shared in the chat uh, a link to a company who's doing something like that, and uh, we have a, a 10x alum, Shabir Bambot. I don't know if you've ever heard or met him. He's at uh, Fisher Scientific, and his entire enterprise is working on an upright uh, breast mammogram type development. So if you're still working in that space, uh, that's a very worthwhile introduction for me to make. Mm, maybe I might be conflicted. So I'd have to learn a little bit more to make sure because I do have a, um, a company uh, also in that space. So for diagnostic, don't get me wrong, that is done and, and will be done and is right. But for, for therapy, it's a little different. Um, you know, actually, that brings me to a, a point when we leave this call, um, should members want to reach out to you? Why would they? What do you do? Are you a consultant? Are you freelance? Can they engage you? How so? Yeah, uh, I do do some consulting on the time. I have a full-time job, uh, uh, but it, as I can work it in on, you know, evenings and weekends, I love to um, work with uh, early stage stuff and anything that I can help with. Yes. I, I mean, for me, the most rewarding thing is to be able to help someone bring their idea to translation, right? It's all about that. Okay. Uh, and actually I'm going to put another link in the chat. And this one is to the presentation that Shabir uh, did uh, on this channel um, more than a year ago now. So you can give that a view. Oops, um, I sent that to Fabian only. I meant to send it to everyone. Um, that you can give a, a look to and see if there's a conflict or if that's somebody you need to meet. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh -huh. Look forward to it. And that's really what these calls are about. It's it's as much networking and connecting people and helping everyone get things done as it is educating um, the rest of us. So please continue. Yeah. So you mentioned value proposition before. I think the thing that I stress here is um, that you know, it needs to be crisp and the doctors, the patients and the payers all need to win if your idea is going to make it and they need to win enough to call it like a, a 10 time kind of, um, you know, 10 X improvement. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I like to summarize everything on one page. So this is a brief foray I did into hyperbaric oxygen. And, you know, if you can do this, then you're starting to get ready, right? So and it's a great exercise. I do this with the um, companies that I consult for, ask them to summarize everything on one page, not using any technical language, no, no jargon, no technical details, no confidential information, because this is something that you want to be able to hand out. You wouldn't believe how many um, iterations I go through on these things, right? It, I would. Oh, you know, <laughs> it sounds so easy, great. One page. It's, mm -hmm. it's horrible. But here was one thing that I wanted to point out is I think earlier someone mentioned that like the academics don't understand the value. Part of this is they are so used to, especially physicists, talking about their new detector, right? Their new algorithm, their new tool. And when they pitch that, they're talking to either investors or people who are going to help them bring it to market. You know, what they need to do is really talk about the capability. Right? Don't make the investor do the cognitive load of understanding how that translates into benefit. Right, So talk about benefits. Don't talk about technology. If they're curious, they're going to ask. And that's when you can launch into that. But at the top level, it should all be capability. Um, you know, so, um, you know, there's that. Um, I, yeah. So I think that is probably... Um, I, I do have to give a shout out to the Stanford Biodesign. Um, I think I, I mentioned them earlier, but I usually do kind of like an inventory when I'm working with um, startups and sort of see how they're doing on these things. And I, I, you know, almost everyone needs help on regulatory strategy and reimbursement basics. And I'm not an expert on that, but I can at least identify, you know, people who can help with that. 
And we might know a few people here in the network. I bet you do. I yes, we do. certainly do. And they have been guests many times and some of them uh, quite dear friends. Um, I'll throw a date out at you, uh, Michelle, April uh, 11th to the 13th. We're going to be meeting in person in San Diego. If you could join us, that'd be great. Um, I'll put General, it on my oh, and I do want uh, Fabian, if you'll uh, unmute yourself and introduce yourself to the group. This is your first time joining us, I think. Yep, I'm Fabian Temme, and um, I got uh, development out of the University of Hamburg Eppendorf. Um, so I've been through all the way through the process. And um, in Germany, um, there's lots of technology developed, but mostly it doesn't get translated into real innovations that can get used, as normally the technology distribution centers or technology transfer centers are the end point of any innovation. And um, which is also one of the big issues. I don't know if it's in your country, but there are lots of breaks in between grants. So you split teams, you've got one grant and it's the next grant. And in between, you've got completely new teams. And if there's no next grant, basically many ideas get lost on the way. No, that's an excellent point. You know, continuity when you've got students, especially a lot of the work ends up being done by students, right? The, the professor is the visionary, but in the end, you know, they have to parcel out the little jobs that get done by students and they're on the move. Of course they are. And um, that is definitely a, a continuity is is a problem, and it's a frustrating one, especially if you're you know sitting there at a company and and by the time you look at how you're going to integrate this work, you, that person has moved on, and yep. um, that that that's definitely a challenge. Yep. Fabian, are you with a company or are you an independent consultant? Um, I've got my own startup, Medical Cooling, and we are fundraising like all the time. So if anyone wants to invest in high-risk medical device company, you're absolutely welcome. High-risk, okay, bring it on. That's what we need right now. Yep. And a funny anecdote to the switch is the whole Dutch healthcare system cannot connect the ambulances that just got new technology to the hospitals because they got rid of the programmer that prepared it. So often it's really the single person that could do all the connections and if they're lost, there are issues. Thank you for that. And um, there's quite a slight conversation going on. And it's funny because not an hour ago, Ross and I were scooped at what happened at uh, RAPS. I mean, it was announced at RAPS that uh, the Swiss are looking to get around, not so much get around MDR, but has it got postponed yet again, that they're going to, uh, there's not a date, I think, associated with this yet, but that the Swiss are going to allow products cleared through FDA to be marketed in Switzerland, even if there is no EU MDD stuff. Um, and uh, Mark just scooped it and Fabian said, this is awesome. And, you know, all these things. So it just that it's going back and forth. Not final, they're still debating it, but um, they said that uh, at, there is a thousand of the 5,000 companies that used to sell into Switzerland that have uh, ceased to distribute in Switzerland because of not only the EU MDR, but the combination of what the Swiss put on top of the MDR. And so now that they're seeing that the Swiss population really will have a lack of access to medical devices like we've been predicting for all of Europe. So that's where it's at. Fascinating, fascinating. It's, it's the first um, positive piece of news out of, Europe for regulatory stuff that I've heard in, in quite a while. I know MDR has been pushed back yet again. I don't know what the new date is, Michelle, you probably do. But I remember we weren't just a few months ago where the seal was telling us, yeah, no, this time they're really not gonna move it. And yeah, they did again. I mean, I just, the idea of- that, like, No, they, haven't moved, they only it's... moved it once and they only moved it because of COVID. So May 24, of 24 or May 26 of 24 is is still, the, still day. the day. Yeah. And and now they're in a mess because of the, what are they going to do with the people who did the work and did things right and got their MDR certificate if they extend it then it's unfair to those people who who prepare. Uh that that's never a barrier to the European regulators because we saw that happen with consortiums that we were involved in just for reach where they basically forced in people late in the game that hadn't really contributed to uh, addressing the risk up front. And uh, now we've also seen long-term delays on 
uh, registrations that we have under the biocides directive. I mean, we, we had an application under the biocides directive that we filed in 2010. I think we were supposed to be compliant in 2019 and the member reference state still hasn't even reviewed the filing. So we'll see. Uh, Niels from Avania is the fellow I was talking with this morning. And uh, he also gave me the impression that some of the restrictions put on what notified bodies could perform has been lifted slash expanded relative to the original pronouncement where they can now provide consultative services again. Michelle, can you confirm? It, it slightly. I, it, it, I think that that is kind of misunderstood by industry. And I think industry got a little bit overly excited about what they thought that the permissions were going to be. I just went to a webinar by SGS this week and SGS was like, basically nothing's changed in the way that they operate. Niels was speculating that the removal of consultative services made a lot of the work for bodies to be um, so mundane as to have people leave industry or the company because it was like you've taken away the part where I actually could be strategic and contribute and help a company. I don't think so. Um, no? Okay. Um. I, and I think that that when what we think is consultative services is that they're going to act like consultants like I would or Marin would or Rob would. What they're talking about is they would tell you, like, say they gave you a query and you have no idea what they are really asking for or what this question is or how to respond. And you're trying to engage to get clarity on the question. They would tell you we cannot talk to you about the question or tell you what to do because then we're consulting. So what that is intended to open up is allow a dialogue around queries and around things where so you can get on the same page together. It's not for the notified bodies to sit down and help you plan your biocompatibility test plan. Or whatever. And, and, and that was actually specifically what we were talking about, that it you could present your research to the notified body for a submission, but that they could not help you like make sure you do it properly. And that he believed that now they could help you set it up properly. And you're saying, no, that that, that is not that, been relaxed. That's not my understanding. And that was not the understanding I got from SGS on, on this call this hmm. week. I'll, I will tell you some of my highlight reels from that call, if you'd like. Sure. Straight from the notified body. While you look that up, David, you've you are yeah, coming. Uh, yeah, thanks. I was just uh, gonna say you're talking about that that guide that guidance that came out that you know top ten or top fifteen whatever it was things we want to recommend or whatever. Is that what you're referring to, Michelle? And it's it's yeah. just a wish list. It's not anything that's hard and stone, but it's been, like Michelle has pointed out, it's been um, uh, majorly uh, uh, misrepresented by the manufacturers because they saw that and sort of skipped through the part about, you know, this is our recommendations you know, mm -hmm. to, to the commission or whatever, uh, and, and, and it's just recommendations. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's not law. Here's one of my favorite. It's chaos everywhere about pit, how to pick one notified body to the other. He's like, it really doesn't matter. It, we're all in chaos. That's a um, recommendation. Wow. That, that is a, that's just a statement. That's a statement. Yes, yes. I, I just a fact. You need to have the right notified body for your product because not every notified body is allowed to check any type of product. Yep. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The review will take you longer than it took you to put together the technical file. And the other big thing, Joe, and everyone on this line, of course, we're all involved with breakthrough technologies a lot. And, you know, they don't really have a clear path uh, to handle that over in Europe. And uh, that's another another um, issue with uh, companies not going over there. Now, if you've got products on the market, you don't want to walk away from that revenue. But if you're trying to <clears throat> get products on the market, you know, I've, I've just seen this uh, change in past strategies about what countries to go into to generate revenue. Um, uh, even Japan hits that that uh, tier before they go into to go into Europe because they want to generate more revenue to be able to afford to put together that uh, that very expensive dossier. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. We're at the top of the hour. I, I've been wanting to meet your dog, Andy. He's been walking around back and forth <laughs> this entire call. What you know? What what's his or her name? And uh, you know, bring her on camera. Okay. Yeah, this is Gertie. She's uh, got a little Visla. She's uh, a hunting dog, and um, we haven't been hunting much because we've been out of the country. So uh, she's uh, bugging me. She wants to go out in the woods. So I see. Anyway. Perhaps pick up a nice squirrel for dinner or something like that. <laughs> Hopefully a pheasant. Uh, yeah, but sure. Okay. Well, good luck with that. Thank um, you. We, uh, in two weeks time, uh, Monier is going to be our guest. He's going to be talking about quality issues, especially as it relates to non-quality departments. Um, we're going to take our uh, traditional Christmas and New Year's weeks off um, due to light attendance as everyone is out celebrating. Uh, and next week, I am still working on a speaker, but if any of you have something urgent to share with the group, uh, you are welcome to get in touch with me and let me know, and uh, we'll talk about that. But then uh, Rob Packard is going to be talking to us in January, and uh, a reminder to anyone who has something good to share with the group, who wants to take the microphone, that's what we do here. So, Jill, I have, yeah. it, it took, have, have it you took me this it? long, and it was so worth it. If I wait long enough, fun. You know? it was so fun. So just listening to this conversation about Switzerland, um, it, it made me think like, have you ever thought about putting together the advice of an entrepreneurial consortium about here's what would make your market easier to work with? And um, you come up with some guidelines right back at them. One of the ideas that we, well, Dwayne, you probably are working on something like that. I, I, I was going to say, I, I was going to bring up an idea. Um, Sean McGibbon, who's part of Project MedTech, he's a former, he was a, spent 30 years as a healthcare executive at university hospitals up here in Cleveland and then uh, Mount Carmel down in Columbus. He'd be a good presentation uh, one of these weeks on, um, we could, he could cover two things, right? How to get through a value analysis committee within a hospital and how you speed up that sales process and what they look for. That's always a good one. And then the other one would be um, the difficulties of, we talked about universities, but a lot of technology comes out of hospital venture groups as well. And the frustrations, um, frustrations or positives, depending on which group you're working with of, of uh, how to deal with those, because um, uh, that could be a big time issue. Someone dropped in here about the Mayo Clinic. I think it was Ross. And um, we've had great experiences with the Mayo Clinic. I mean, they've got a really good um, uh, program. And then there's other groups that alternatively, like, well, this is being recorded. So other other groups uh, that we've worked with that are not so good. Well, but, I don't, know if, those, I don't yeah. know if those other groups are going to watch this until minute 60 to find out. Um, but still, I appreciate <laughs> your decor. Um, yeah. Decorum. Um, another note is I've been uh, talking with Ross uh, lately uh, about his uh, Basil Systems platform, and I'd encourage anyone on this call who's doing anything regulatory or quality to spend a half hour with the man. I promise you it will be worthwhile. Be delighted to talk to anyone, of course. He's, he, uh, he likes company. He gets lonely. I'm lonely. Minneapolis. It's cold in Minneapolis. Can be. Uh, Michelle, thank you. And uh, thank you. have a good weekend, everyone. Thanks for joining. See you next week. Bye now. Thanks, Joe.